I am not your typical portrait photographer. I photograph portraits of bugs. And when I say bugs, I'm broadly referring to insects, spiders, and other invertebrates, or animals without backbones. You might call them creepy crawlies. I want to talk to you today about wildlife conservation. Now, when you think of wildlife conservation, maybe you imagine images depicting the perils of elephants in Africa. Or maybe you think of polar bears floating into the ocean on melting ice. You probably don't immediately think of bugs. In fact, many of us think the exact opposite. How wonderful would this world be without bugs? While a world without bugs might at first seem appealing, I invite you to explore this idea just a bit further. Without bugs, our dinner plates would look so different. About two-thirds of our plant crops require pollination. So a world without bugs could mean a world without some of our favorite foods, like chocolate and coffee. And let's just be honest with ourselves for a minute. Are we really prepared to face our coworkers in a world without coffee? Without bugs, we'd be drowning in a sea of natural waste, like dead leaves, wood, rotten fruit, even the carcasses of dead animals. Bugs are wonderful decomposers. They help break down organic material so that it can be more effectively decomposed by bacteria. Without bugs, many of our food webs would collapse. Bugs provide a foundational food source in so many food chains. If we want birds, we need bugs. If we want fish, we need bugs. If we want reptiles and amphibians and bats and shrews and mice and moles and anteaters, or any other animal that eats bugs or eats other animals that eat bugs, then we need bugs. And while you might find this just a little bit disgusting, even humans eat bugs. It remains a scarce practice here in the US but over two billion people across the world regularly consume bugs. They might be small, but bugs are packed with protein, fiber, good fats, and other important minerals. All in all, bugs provide over $57 billion in ecosystem services every single year. And this is at no cost to us. But here's the scary part we are experiencing a massive decline of bug populations throughout the world. One recent study showed a 45% decline of invertebrates in the last 35 years. Another study showed a 76% decline of flying insects alone. Now, it would be difficult for us to calculate the impact of the loss of just a single bug species, but as the entire invertebrate population begins to collapse, we'll be left with dysfunctional ecosystems unable to support life. So if bugs are so important, why do they exist only at the edge of our human consciousness? Why are we made aware of their presence only when they are an inconvenience, like when mosquitoes or gnats bother us during our outdoor adventures? Or when bugs eat our most prized garden vegetables or flowers? Or when a spider happens to find us when we are most vulnerable, standing naked, in the shower. <laughs> bugs are everywhere around us, from our indoor spaces, like our basements, our garages, yes, sometimes even our beds, to our outdoor spaces, where we would expect to find them, like our gardens. Why then do we know and care so little about these creatures with which we share the world? Why do we give preferential treatment to things like polar bears and elephants? Why are we so deeply concerned for their well-being? And why do we not share that same sense of concern for bugs? Well, conservation research points to a few primary factors that affects our willingness to conserve different species. One factor is cuteness. Humans are biologically wired to be attracted to cute things like babies. This biological attraction serves the very functional purpose of compelling us to care for our young since they can't care for th themselves. And I know because I have two toddlers at home. But this attraction sometimes spills over into other species and helps explain why we find puppies and kittens so impossibly adorable. We like things with big heads, round cheeks, large foreheads, and huge eyes. 
And we just don't think of bugs as fitting this mold of cute. But let me introduce you to the jumping spider. <laughs> big head, check. Round cheeks, check. Big forehead, check. And huge eyes, check, check, check check, and I could go on. Now, I've always considered jumping spiders to be the puppy dogs of the spider world. They are cute and fuzzy, yes, but more than that, they have this adorable way of cocking their head to the side when they look at you, just like a curious puppy. And I'd like to think that jumping spiders are like gateway spiders. If you can learn to like a jumping spider, then maybe you can learn to like other species of spiders too, like a lynx spider, <laughs> or a crab spider, so named for the way it holds its legs out like a crab, or maybe even an orb weaver spider. All right, so I'm going through these photos just a bit quickly. That was for the arachnophobes in the audience because I see you and I hear you. <laughs> and I recognize that if you are anything like my former self, seeing huge images of spiders might give you some not so happy thoughts. And I don't want to scare you. I am literally trying to do the exact opposite here. So let's move on to something a little less frightening, but no less adorable. The bug world is filled with examples of creatures that do, in fact, meet our cute criteria, like this dragonfly, seemingly smiling back at us. <laughs> or this big-eyed, fuzzy leafcutter bee. Or something that many of us probably find a little bit frightening, like this wasp. It may come as a huge shock to you, but bugs are actually really cute. <laughs> All right, so another factor that affects our willingness to conserve different species is whether or not they provide value. Humans prefer wildlife that are valuable. And I want to point out that all of the bugs I've shown you so far today do have important roles to play in the world. Some pollinate, like this sweat bee. Others help keep pesky bug populations under control through predation, like this tiny parasitoid wasp, no longer than just two millimeters in length. This wasp lays its eggs inside the eggs of stink bugs. Some pretty gruesome stuff happens, and then those wasps help keep those stink bug populations in check, which is great for us. And other bugs are fabulous decomposers, like this green bottle fly, I know you've all killed a ton of these, by the way. <laughs> we often call this a filth fly because it tends to congregate around garbage and dog poop. But every single one of these bugs has an important role to play in the ecosystems where they live. They are all very valuable. Now, the last factor that I want to talk to you about today that affects our willingness to conserve different species is their similarity to us as humans. We prefer wildlife that look and behave like us. Unfortunately for bugs, they are uniquely unhuman. But I want to share a story with a different narrative. Quite by accident, last summer, I discovered a colony of oak tree hoppers in my local arboretum. I was actually chasing around a wasp, and I understand the irony of that, because typically that wasp would be chasing us. But I turned around, and I found myself face to face with this oak branch filled with these tiny treehopper nymphs. Now, this was my bucket list bug, so I was so excited to have found them. <laughs> so I started furiously taking their photos before noticing just a single adult a few inches up on the same branch. Now, at first, I thought this adult seemed very out of place. But upon further investigation, I learned that this is Mother Treehopper. And she keeps careful watch over her entire colony of offspring from the time she lays her eggs until those young eventually leave the colony as adults. So for the next five weeks, I photographed this colony. I watched as that Mother Treehopper watched over her young nymphs or babies and protected them from predators like wasps. I watched as those young grew larger and larger, molting every few days or shedding their exoskeleton as they grew. 
And I watched as those young grew into the most gorgeous young adults. Now you'll notice these young adults look very different than the more muted coloration of their mother. I like to consider this the rebellious teenager stage. <laughs> they have stripes and these bright red eyes, a relic from their childhood. Now interestingly, they will darken in color over about two weeks time to more closely resemble that coloration of their mother. You can see the mother here on the right with her newly emerged adult offspring on the left. And here is the entire colony, with the mother watching over all of her young adult children. So I was returning to the Arboretum every day, sometimes even twice a day, in hopes of photographing this darkening of color in those new adults. And one day, I noticed one of the adults looked just a little bit different than the rest. Its wings were curled. Now, I assumed those wings would eventually correct themselves and they would straighten out. But no matter how many times I returned to that oak tree, I could always pinpoint that one individual because its wings never did correct themselves. So there was one point in time during that five-week span when I just could not get to the Arboretum for about three whole days. And wouldn't you know it, in those three days, all of those new adults matured enough that they could fly, and away they flew. So I returned to the Arboretum after those three days to find a nearly empty oak branch. But there was one last remaining adult offspring. It was that individual whose wings never fully developed. That wing deformation rendered this individual flightless. So it could not leave that oak branch where it was born and raised by its dedicated mother. And just like the most dedicated of human parents, that mother tree hopper never left her last remaining child. And just as hoped, that child did in fact darken in color to more closely resemble its mother. We've let ourselves believe that bugs are nothing like us. But this narrative simply isn't true. Photography has allowed me to get up close and personal with bugs and provide a view of them that many of us have just never before seen. And what I once knew only as something scary and disgusting and terrible has become something beautiful. And I now recognize that these creatures are living, breathing animals with families. And they are worthy and deserving of the same care and appreciation that we give without question to other animals like polar bears and elephants. So I ask this of you. Next time you see a bug, before thinking, kill it with fire, <laughs> ask yourself instead, what role does this creature play in the larger environment? And what might the consequences be if it were no longer here? Thank you.